now introduce Kelly Wheeler, our um, senior um, software engineer from Lidos, to present the next talk, which is IEDB Query API or the IQ API. Thanks so much, Kelly. Okay. As Nina said, I'm Kelly Wheeler. I'm a senior software engineer working with the IEDB. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the API that we have to give direct access to our data via programmatically generated uh, methods. It's a very simple and powerful query interface to get the IDB data out. So first off, I kind of explain what an API is in general. It's an application programming interface. It's another way to access our data other, otherwise from the website. So as a user, you would normally go and access the website through the home page like you would you would do normally. And then that would query our, our database and get the information and return it back to you in a very visual format that you can consume in a browser. And then you could export it from there and use it in your in your projects or any any of your uh, applications that you need it for. What the API provides is a access to the same exact set of data, but more programmatically through this through this application called Postgres or Postgres T, as I I sometimes refer to it, just because it it's a little confusing because Postgres is the database as well that drives it, which is an open open source, publicly accessible, widely used uh, interface to access data that we consume, that we put our data into. It is the same data as on the website, just formatted a little bit differently in a more programmatic friendly format to, to get out from. And as you can see here, over the last six months, and actually this month number may be a little higher now, it's used for approximately 650 queries a day, if not more. So how does it work? You go to, the, you use this URL to access the API in general. And then from that, it breaks down into the search uh, database tables or endpoints that correlate directly to our tabs within the IDB. So for the epitopes or the antigens or the, all, any of the different assays or the, the receptors or references, you can access it through these search interfaces. You then, from there, you formulate your queries based on the filters that you would like to, ma again, matching the, the, you can match the IDB website. So this example here is searching for the linear sequence of Synfecal using these, uh, this quantifier here, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit in a, another couple slides. And then you put it all together and you have the base API, you have your, your search endpoint or search table here, so you search on other epitopes, and then you have your filters. So the, in this case, again, Synfecal as a, as a linear sequence. So when you put that all together, which is the same query here, you will get back uh, JSON format or or TSV if you specify that. But most of, mostly it's used in JSON format. And that's the, the, going to be the format that I'll show all my examples in of all the data in the tables. This one's filtered down a little bit just to to give a good example. But you can see all the information for those three epitopes that we have within the data within the database currently for for any any synfecal linear sequences and it returns it as an as an array of json objects one per row if you now I guess to, to database tables that was the epitope you can see here that we have very similar structures for for t cell t cell assays and all of the endpoints are going to have very similar structures with very with the same search parameters for the most part. Just depending, on, it'll depend on the on how the data is structured within those different endpoints and search tables. But you can see here all the assays that that are associated with that with that structure uh, linear sequence as well here. 
So when you're going to when you're working with these, there are a couple different ways to refine your queries to better organize your data within your searches. The first of it is horizontal filtering, which is the select keyword, which only returns the relevant fields that you would like. It's, it, it's the same as if you're familiar with doing database searches. It, it, it's how you, you limit horizontally what fields you want to return, and then you return all of them, all of that. So here you can see we're selecting the structure ID, the description, the source organism names, and the parent antigen names, which is those example earlier that I said was pared down a little bit. This actually is ran on that query for those examples. So then you can get just those fields so that you can pare down just exactly what you want out of there. The other way is vertical filtering, which is the, the meat and potatoes of, so to speak, of how you would really want to query the database. This is how you, you filter out based on filters that you want within, the, the, within the, each individual search table. Because as you can see here, the epitope search has over a million records in it alone, and some of the, the assay ones have you know, multiple millions, five, six million records, which you wouldn't really re realistically want to, to use this, the API for because that's just going to be a lot of data when you would want your own particular data out of it. So you can see here that we filtered by, again, the linear sequence equals SynFecal, and that, return, that filters it down to three records, which is exactly what this is right here, is these two put together effectively. So well, how I, I, I spoke on earlier that you have these, these operators that you need to use to communicate with the API's interface, showing how you want to filter on those on those vertical filters. So here is all of them here, with is quite extensive. Pretty much any database filtering that you would like to do within Postgres, you can do within Postgres T using these operators. But the ones that we found that that people use most most of the time, and it will cover most all of the, the, the queries within the IEDB structures, is going to be this equals one, which is the EQ dot, and then you put the either numeric or string field that you would like to search on here after that. Or this contains uh, one, which is how you search on these arrays of fields, which in, for example, in the antigen search table, because of the fact that it, the, the linear sequences are associated with the assays and the epitopes, it gets collapsed into these, these array fields here. So you would need to use a contains uh, operator or an overlap operator within these curly braces here to show that you want to, say, you want to search these linear sequences that contains this value in it because they can have multiple. Again, it's using Synfecal because that's the example that I'm going to use for, through all of these. So as I, as I hinted on earlier, or just a bit ago, all of the, the, each of the search endpoints will have pretty much the same search fields within them. But some of them, as you can see, are going to be, if they're pluralized, that's going to indicate that there are a, an array of those values but you can re replicate the same query across all of the different search endpoints very easily using the same, almost the same terms. You just need to look to see if it has a sequence, you know, if it has a plural version of it or the, the singular version to see if you need to use an equals or a contains. So why would somebody want to use the API over using, say, the, the, the standard interface or what you would want to use the API for in general. It gives direct access to computer-friendly and program-consumable JSON formats, or you can get more human-friendly TSV formats that without having to use a web interface so you can script it to, to get you the information that you need in a more programmatic or 
repeatable format. You can incorporate the IDB queries into your code if you're writing an application that you want to utilize the IDB data within or do analysis on it more easily into code without having to go to the website, export the data, it, put that into your application, and, and it's a little more clunky that way. You can work with the IDB data in whatever language that you're, you're familiar with programmatically and not have to, to, to work around the limitations of, of the interface on the IDB website. You can also easily link the data from the IDB to other resources because you can do these, these queries on the fly and get the data as it's, as it's updated in real time so that you can that you can in, integrate it more easily into your your live service or your your program that you're running. You can also periodically rerun automated queries to check for any new data that we put in because our data is, is constantly updated and on a weekly basis we're adding multiple more references of, of information which extrapolates into tons of other data that you can programmatically then check for changes or or differences in in it in those queries. So what you what you can query within the IDB from the the API should be everything uh, that you could from the website. So if you we love to hear of any issues that you have or if you can't replicate something, uh, we'd love to hear them and, and, and send us over any information that you have feedback is always appreciated so we can improve the, the experience within the API. So how you can get started is we have the Swagger documentation, which is a uh, web interface so that you can visualize a little bit better and how to, how to query on these from a web interface so you can get your feet wet and, and test out before you go into your applications and write your, your, your HTTP calls and get calls to, to access this API. So here's an example of reproducing a website query using this Swagger doc documentation. Again, it's the Sunfeckle ex example that I used earlier, but here you can see you would go into the Swagger documentation, you would go down to the epitope search section, you would find this linear sequence field here, and then you would put in your search parameter. Now, when you're using this Swagger endpoint or Swagger uh, interface to access the API, you still need to use those operators that I spoke to earlier because that's still what the API is expecting to, to, to process your queries correctly. So you can see it, it goes down there. And then in real time, or in live results, once you execute it, you can see it will get you the, you know, an example of a curl, curl response for command line calling of your exact query that you replicated in that, in the Swagger documentation, as well as the URL here that, that you can, you can put into a browser and get that, that result back or put into your, your application to, to query and, and reproduce this exactly as well as the data down here, you can see exactly what's being returned. This is the, the exact data that will come out of the API in, the, in its JSON format, which you can actually change up here if you want to look at it in the, the TSV format as well within the Swagger documentation. So here's some examples of how you can do it in your different languages, in your different uh, programming languages that you would might want to do. So you can see we have a Python example up here, an R example, raw JavaScript if you want to do it in a JavaScript, or jQuery, and then PHP and Perl. We have a couple other examples. You can see they're basically all doing just HTTP GETs to the API because it's a very simple and straightforward interface. Again, with you select all your different parameters, and here's all the examples that you can use. We also have examples that I'll, I'll show a little bit later that of uh, some use cases that we have documented that you can, that you can reference to, to try to build your, your queries that you may want to do. So with that going through, 
So we this has been this API has been up and running for a little over two years now, and we are constantly expanding on it. But one of the things that I wanted to wanted to go over is now we one thing that's coming in over the next couple weeks or months is we are going to incorporate all of the export fields that you can see on the the website into the API as well. This is one of the things that we've that we've had gotten feedback from is that the API is very powerful and you can search everything, but you can't get all of the data from the the IEDB website through the API, only what what we had the limited data set that we had in there. So we are we are integrating the export fields into it so you can get the exact format that the exports come out with all that data within the API through those same search uh, doing your searches through the through the API as you want. Uh, you it greatly expands the functionality. It adds a lot of data from the IDB, exposes it through the API. It's currently available for the the B cell receptors and the T cell receptor queries, with all the other endpoints getting their their versions in the near near future. Like I said, I I'm hoping for the next within the next couple of weeks to the next month or two. Uh, it can be directly queried, be similar to how I showed you the search queries, or via resource embedding, which is a very powerful uh, aspect of the the Postgres T that I haven't really touched on because it's a little bit more advanced, but I'll, I'll show an example of it here going forward. So here's an example of a B cell receptor export. This is the, the custom exports which I went over on day one, showing all of the different fields that are available within the IEDB exporting. And then here it is represented in the, what the API would, would, would spit out. And as you can see, all of the, all these fields, so like you, the group IRI for receptors is available right here. And it matches one, one to one, all the fields that are available will, will be available within these export uh, tables and endpoints. So how do you access this export data within the API is all the search endpoints except for antigen because antigen pretty much the export is the same as the search. It doesn't have a whole lot of additional data currently, but that could change in the future. We'll have an, an analogous export endpoint. And it's all, all the export endpoints are keyed on an identifier, which, for example, on the receptors is this group ID that will share between the search fields and the export fields. And then the field names, once you convert the names, will match up. Like this is an example of a JSON export from the, from the IDB website. And this is the output from that same query via the, the API uh, export endpoint. You can see all the names, once they get converted, most notably you convert all spaces to underscores and these dashes to a double underscores. So how would you do this? You would, you would run your, your, B, your B cell search query as is selecting the receptor group ID, which is that identifier that joins it with, with your, you know, synfecal example here. That would return you back a group ID. You would then directly plug that into the export endpoint here for that same, that same search endpoint. And here's the result that you'd get back for that particular export. This is the traditional way to do it. You, you would do two, two API calls based on what you return back. Now, here's an example using the resource embedding that I spoke to earlier. Because of, our, because of the fact that our searches and our exports are directly linked on that identifier, you can use this resource embedding here, which is saying, basically, do my search. Here's my parameters that I want. Here is what I want to return. 
and I want everything from the BCR, BCR export, which is what this wild card here is indicating. I want all of those fields as well. And here you can see it's all returned in one call that, that you would get through. So if you want some more information on the API itself, here is, we have the Swagger documentation here that I showed. This is the Postgres T inter reference in general for the, 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 the software that runs the API. We have use cases here in, our, in, our, in a Jupyter notebook that, that our team has come up with that you can poke through and, and, and get some real, real, world real world ideas of what we use it for. And then we have this help, help desk, uh, Zendesk overview article here as well that shows a little bit more and goes into more depth on how you can utilize it. And then here's our team that developed the API and I think that's my time, Nina. Yes, perfect timing, Kelly. Thank you so much. And I'll give you a minute to have a look at the chat because there are some, uh, excuse me, the Q&A because there are some questions that have come in for you too. But hopefully that demonstrates, actually in both of these projects and most of what we talk about over these three days, are really good examples of feedback that we've gotten from users. In this case, the API, our more programmatically inclined users have said, hey, how can I get the data out of the IEDB more programmatically? And so that's something we workshopped for a number of years and, and now that's available. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a key example of why we listen to the feedback and take it on board because we wanna make sure our resources are useful to all of the users and all of their different areas that they're working in. But with that, I will invite Kelly and Marcus back to the virtual floor to start our first Q&A. And Marcus, I might hand the first question over to you. Okay, thanks, Nina. Uh, so the first question uh, was from Hur. Oh, Hassani, I, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Sorry, I joined a bit late. Are the 3D structures experimentally proven or they could be prediction? Yes, <laughs> it's both. So uh, for the assay tab, you only have the experimental proven. So only structure from the position on the PDB, just like X-ray crystal or NMR or uh, cryo -AM. Uh, but for the Epto and also the monomer browser, you can have, or uh, if you if you have this structure, like experiment proven structure, you're gonna be that one is gonna be chosen. But if you don't, but you do have, uh, there is a, 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 a structure from uh, AlphaFold database that are gonna be uh, selected as well. So, but you, got, you can see the, like the name is different. So. You can see the difference between if it is uh, experimental proven or if it's like a predicted one on the name based on the name of the structure. Oh, yeah. I think now it's Kelly, right? Like it's gonna be like ping pong. Yeah, I'll 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 take one. Uh, I'm going to answer the one uh, about the wild card. Let me pull up my. Brain. And if you could repeat the question in full, Kelly. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Christopher Thorpe asks if there's, if it's possible to use wildcards for queries to find sequence variants of peptides. Um, I don't believe it. You, I don't believe that there's a way to use wildcards from that standpoint, you can do uh, multiple using the contains. So if you if you have multiple variants of the 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 sequence that you want to search, you can do that. Or the other option you you have is you can do a like search with wildcards. If you look at the if you look up the 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 uh, structure for that, I'm trying to think of it off the top of my head. So if you like one to search, I think it's stars. But you can search something like that 
where you can do a like search, so you can do a substring search uh, using using wildcards. I don't believe there is a wild a straight wildcard search, but there might be if you if you explore into those operators. Anything that that you can use, you can find in those operators, then you can uh, you can search on on our, on our data. You want to take the next one, Marcus? Uh, sure. So, anonymous entity ask it in the moon browser too. What is the difference between lower bound and upper bound response frequency? That's a really good question. So uh, they are just confident interval, which means that the lower uh, the lower bound it shows that the minimum it's, it's made a response frequency. Uh, so you have this. Uh, the, over, the lower limit of, of, of this uh, computation interval, which everything that is down there, uh, that there's no score. Uh, the re true response rate is not lower than this value. So uh, if you wanted to use this as analysis, I recommend you to use the lower bound because it is like a, a safer, it, the score is a little bit lower than compared to the upper bound, but it's, uh, it's safer to say that uh, that value is true, that um, it, it's, um, uh, that represent uh, with a high confidentiality that uh, the score of that amino acid. Uh, now it's you, Kelly. Yep. Um, an anonymous attendee asks that they worked with the I API previously, a problem extracting info regarding epitopes it was not clear to me which table to extract the info from and will mimic the assay table on the on the ui could i please clarify so what you will want for the assay tables are each individual assay endpoint let me share my screen again how do i get this out of the way okay well So when you when you run a query on the on the IDB, you have these T cell assays, B cell assays, and the ligand assays. So there their endpoints on here are the T cell search, B cell search, and uh, MHC search. So those return back will return back the the fields that are shown on those the the tabs every field on the on the tabs in the on the website here should be referenced in the in the api so that is one thing on the search table should have all of these directly accessible within the within the the tab, table data so hopefully that answers that question that you would want to use those those endpoints I'll take the next one, Marcus. Okay, sure. Uh, Ramona Carr, how's response frequency calculated for amino acid? That's a really good question. So the way it's calculated is based on the number of, of assays that is positive tested against the uh, how many assays that was negative tested. So if you, for example, you have just one assay that test is positive, uh, it's gonna, the, the response frequency score is going to be lower if you have like a a hundred of time of tested, but in 99% it was positive and just 1% is negative. So the response frequency, it, it uh, measures the amount of time that was tested and how many times was that positive tested against how many times negative tested. So the amino acid is the, uh, you have the, the your epitope and that epitope, each residue has a position. That position, it is uh, is aligning with this the antigen. So, uh, so so uh, and we have a lot of epitopes, so some of them overlaps. So just getting those uh, one by one, the residue by residue, getting this how many times that residues, that residue for, on that position, it is uh, including an epitope that is positive tested or negative tested, and that's the way you're calculated for uh, residues by residue for for every amino acid. Thank you. That was a great question. Okay. Uh, and I have an anonymous attendee here asking 
that they interested, interested in integrating the IDB database into their project, a trained model to predict novel allergen epitopes. They were wondering, uh, may I know more about how I could possibly request access to the database API? The API is available to anybody. So all you need to do is go to the, the, the links that were provided in the, in the slides earlier, uh, and that, that'll get you a right to, to what you need to, to do. And then you can filter on whatever you need to search for and, and whatever data you need to get out of it. But I'm actually going to take this chance because I had another one that's very similar that says, unfortunately, there's no link to the IQ API on the website. We actually have it integrated now up into the uh, more IDB section up here. It's directly integrated up here now. That takes us to the, the the documentation, which you can then get to the the Swagger documentation here, or all the any of the inf other information that you need from the API on our website. We don't directly link to it because uh, having somebody click on it would would create a big call that could possibly take take some some time to to render. Kelly, would you be able to just show from the home page one more time? There was a little bit of a delay in when you shared your screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Let me share it again. In case anyone blinked. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, no. It's a, it's a Zoom a Zoom delay. Okay. I can do it from here. So if you go up here and see the more IDB section at the top, we have an IQ API link now. Which is actually one of the one of the I'm glad somebody brought this up because it was one of the questions that we had and one of the improvements we've made is that it wasn't referenced anywhere on the website. It was just kind of hidden, but it's a powerful tool to use. So if you click on this, you can see it goes to the the documentation, like I said. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, Marcus. Okay. And Adam's attendee ask it. Can one search for APTOF with similar 3D structure? Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if I found your question, but uh, I would say yes. So every time you are searching for a specific APTOF, you can search for the linear APTOF. And if that uh, if that APTOF it has uh, is mapped in, 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 with an antigen that it, it contains a, a, a 3D structure, like uh, experiment proven, or from PDB database or from model on AlphaFold database, it's gonna uh, gonna have this 3D icon that's gonna map that APTOP uh, within the, the 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 3D structure of that antigen. Uh, okay. Uh, I believe it's Kieran. I'm sorry if, again if I misspelled mispronounce your name. Uh, asks if there's a limit to the number of API calls allowed per user. If we need to make a continuous API calls with large volume of queries, are there specific guidelines or best practices we should follow to manage this effectively? I don't believe there is limits. Uh, that would actually be a very good, a better question to to email to the team so we can we can investigate. You should be able to do fairly continuous uh queries but i wouldn't hammer it because i don't know we we would need to investigate to make sure that we don't have some kind of uh filter in in place that would you know would would limit you or or cause cause you to 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 get onto a, a blacklist or something i i'm not 100 percent sure that I, I would say to to email our team and and we can have we can have some of some of the other people look into it to see exactly if there's a if there's a server limit or or something in our security uh, setup. Hey Marcus, if you want to go with okay. your next one, sure. Uh, Nina, do we still have time? We have about one to two minutes left, so okay. try. And... Okay. Well. Okay. This one question, um, Patrick Wu. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for demonstrating IDB 3.1. My internet connection briefly cut out, so I wanted to follow you up on your discussion about T and B cell apetopes in relation to their location. Did you mention that apetopes on the surface are more likely to be B cells apetope 
So uh, I was explaining there's you're expecting that the B cells have to be more to the um, exposed area of the antigen because the antibody needs to <laughs> to get in there and, and like interact with that region. Uh, if uh, of course you can have like a inside of the protein as well, but it's more rare. And most uh, and for T cells, since the protein is cleaved and presented on this MAT, just a small piece of it, which is called the, the peptide. Uh, so uh, you can also have like from the intern of the protein. So so yeah, you're in theory you're gonna expect that B cell zeptop be more exposed to the surface because uh, the antibody needs to go there and interact with. Why don't you keep going ahead and do yours, Marcus? I'll I'll type my answers out to the couple that I have. Oh, okay. So Saghar Kabinejadian. Can the peptide sequence can be changed in the peptide MHC complex through the structure in the assay viewer? That's a great question. Uh, but no, <laughs> the, uh, the IC3 doesn't, uh, I, I don't think I, I, IC3 has this function of mutation of the, the, uh, of the residue, but uh, we can suggest that that'll be like a, a great addition to the tool if it doesn't not do it already. Um, so yeah, thanks for your question. And I think for me, okay, okay, sorry. Okay. I, I can pretty quickly respond just one more, Mauricio. All the data is plotted in the web browsers. Keller is linear, a position. Peptides are segment of the protein. Do you use the center of the peptide to place the peptide in the graph? So actually, no. We, uh, so I'm gonna say like you have like different epitopes and the epitopes is, is mapped to different positions of the antigen. So for example, imagine like you're mapping, there's a one top is mapping to a position one to 10, another one is position two to 11 or 12. So you're, uh, so uh, position by position, you have like a first position, you only have like one uh, that residue is only mapped to one epitope. So position two is mapped to two epitopes. So in with those, it's positive and negative, you're gonna calculate it. So it's not centering, it's just like a, you, you have this overlap on the peptides. So since you have access to this position of the, we are matching that epitope sequence uh, in the antigen positions, we know which, uh, what is the position of each epitope. And based on that, we can compare it based on the position of the, of the, the, the residue. And, and how many times that appears and on, on epitopes and how many times was test positive and negative and with that generating the, uh, re the response frequency score. So, yes, uh, that's it. That's <laughs> I it. think you can. So, thanks so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you so much, Kelly. And Kelly mentioned that he was typing some responses. So please do check in your Q&A box. There is an answered column and any follow-ups via a written response will be in there. So um, to our users, definitely please check that out.